in place. So uh, thank you so much for getting up early this morning to come talk with me about um, reptiles. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a couple of the projects that we're currently working on in my lab. But first, I want to start by talking a little bit about the larger questions that we're trying to address in my research program and some of the approaches that we're using to answer those questions. So as you can see from my title, um, we are really interested in how a changing environment affects the animals that live in that environment. Oh, here we go. So how animals respond to change is via this thing called stress. And I'm going to start by giving you an example of what stress is using myself and how I perceive stress. Um, stress is basically just the body's reaction to a stimulus. It can be a real stimulus or it can be imagined. And so for me, the way I think about it is if I'm trying to leave to go do something relaxing with my family, I get really stressed out thinking about everything I have to do before I leave for that trip. And the good thing about this is the stress gives me energy to get that work done efficiently so I can leave. The bad part is usually if it is too prolonged and goes on too long, right when I leave for vacation, I get sick. Um, I, some of you may have experienced this before. I'm really good at this. Um, about midway through vacation here, I might start thinking about everything I have to do or mistakenly check my email. And then I remember what I have to do when I get back, I'm stressed again. And then finally, if I'm able to subdue this, hopefully for a few days, things are good. But when I, the minute I return to my office and see the pile of work waiting on my desk or my inbox, my stress levels come back up so I can again deal with this. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is how I perceive stress. But this is probably not how the rest of you perceive stress. Maybe some of you. But there's a lot of variation. And in the animals that we study, there was also a lot of variation. And reptiles are actually the ideal model to address this sort of question in a natural system. They're prevalent in many different types of environments, so I can look at different environmental challenges. They have actually the exact same hormones related to the stress response that we do as humans, and those functions are the same. So I could take my stress hormones and I could inject them into this marine iguana or this garter snake or this side blotch lizard and get a physiological effect, and vice versa. I could take their hormones and, and get an effect on myself. The other thing is, when you're trying to understand how natural populations respond, you need to understand this variation. And so a lab model is not necessarily the best, the best model for this sort of question because most of those are bred to reduce variation. And so we really do have to focus on natural populations to get at this. And then finally, in order to do physiology in the field, this, this um, characteristic of territoriality is really important. I can go and find these individuals reliably in the same place in the field year after year. So every December, I know this iguana is going to be out on his rock and waiting for me to come hopefully collect a blood sample. <laughs> so what does stress look like in nature? Well, when we look at organisms in their natural environment, we see that they have many different challenges that they have to deal with on a regular basis. And this could be trying to escape from a predator. It could be regrowing a tail after a predator bites it off. It could be dealing with a parasite burden. I always find a way to get this tick picture in. I just think it's really cool. Um, some organisms uh, will migrate hundreds to thousands of miles every year. Others have to maintain a warm body temperature when it's really cold outside because they don't have internal heating like us. And perhaps the largest challenge that all organisms deal with is reproduction. This is the main goal of most organisms out in the natural environment, passing their genes on to future generations. And it is quite challenging. Now, what all of these things have in common is they have the uh, capability to cause stress to the organism, but they also require energy to deal with. And this is a major question that we're trying to answer in biology, is how do organisms deal with multiple of these costly processes at the same point in time? So if we pretend this black box here is an animal, and it's out in its natural environment, we see that it only has a certain amount of resources available through the food that it eats 
and stores located in its body. We also see that there's a lot of potential outputs. This is by no means exhaustive, but just to give you an idea, um, growth, immunity, and reproduction are some, some big expensive things to maintain. Now in nature, these resources are often a limiting um, commodity. And because of that, if an organism is gonna do something like produce that cute baby penguin I showed you on the last slide, it's gonna reduce energy available for other systems like the immune system. Or let's say you're dealing with a heavy parasite burden or regrowing a tail like the lizard I showed you. That's gonna limit energy potentially into other systems so it's harder to produce offspring, resulting in what we refer to as a trade-off. So we do know a lot about how the immune system and the reproductive system interact. And it does seem that they do compete for resources. And we see this across different species. So in general, if we look across animals, we see that immunity generally decreases during the most costly reproductive stages. We see this in birds, reptiles, and even us as humans during pregnancy. And we're not really sure why this occurs. It's thought maybe it's adaptive to prevent miscarriage of the fetus during pregnancy, but again, we're, we're still trying to figure out. In my laboratory, we've done a series of controlled experiments in the lab setting that have manipulated various arms of this diagram and very well documented this competition for resources among these two systems. But what we're really interested in is what happens when we put this animal back into its natural environment, when the environment is not controlled, it's fluctuating. This is what these animals are encountering in nature. This is what they have to deal with. How do these environmental changes affect these energetic decisions that they're making? So I came to Utah about, well, almost five years ago now, and I wanted to start answering some of these questions. And so I wanted to go establish my nice, pristine field sites. Now, this is what I found. And this is what you'll see in most areas where these lizards are found in high numbers. So this begs the question, what is natural now? Um, this is becoming the new natural for the populations on this planet. And as our population growth continues to increase at very quick rates, we need to really understand what this sort of environmental change means for the animals that inhabit or used to inhabit these environments, depending on what species we're talking about. So this is one of the questions that we're trying to address in our lab, not just these natural challenges that I talked to you about before, but how these new human disturbances or human landscape changes are affecting the population, populations that live um, in these environments. So how do you monitor this sort of thing? Well, traditionally, scientists monitor impact using Censuses. They'll go out and they'll count the number of individuals in a population to see how big that population is. They'll collect demographic information. So they'll say, this is how many females, how many males, how many offspring are in that population. Or they can look at behavioral responses um, of individuals in that population to see how they um, interact with each other or perhaps respond to a person or some specific sort of disturbance. In my laboratory, we're using, in addition to these traditional methods, a more physiological approach. And what I mean by that is we're focusing on the individuals in that population and, and what varies among those individuals, not just the population as a whole. So to give you an example, this is one of my field sites in the Galapagos. And um, this is a local Ecuadorian student, Eric, that's worked with us for three of the trips down there. And this is one of my PhD students, Lori, and they're doing um, body mass measurements on this marine iguana. And there's, a, there's our high resolution ultrasound there. After doing body mass measurements, they're gonna actually measure the number and size of eggs in this animal to see how big its clutch or egg number is. And one other thing that we commonly do, this is actually a previous graduate student of mine, um, Nick, who's sitting right here in the front of the audience. And he, he is actually now a high school teacher in Ogden. Um, but he's helping me collect a blood sample from this animal so he can say something about the hormones and the immune system of this animal. Now, in combination with traditional methods, this sort of physiological approach has some real advantages. It allows for fast detection. 
So we don't need to wait generations to see if that population size changes. We can tell right at the instant that we're measuring, well, a week later after we run the assays in the lab, whether or not something different or interesting is going on. It also, it also gives us an idea of the mechanism, so an understanding of how these changes might be affecting the individuals. And this understanding of how, I think, provides much better insight for how to better manage populations in the wild. And the thing that's really surprising about this is there's actually very little application of this sort of approach so far in conservation biology. Really, the few things that people are doing is going and trying to measure stress, measure these hormones that I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk. Um, this is the traditional way to assess stress in a natural population. P primarily, these adrenal steroids, cortisol, and similar metabolites. And as I mentioned before, these are the exact same hormones that are found in humans, as that are found in reptiles, in birds, basically any vertebrate you want to talk about. And the functions are also highly conserved. So what do these hormones do? Well, my students can tell you that one of my biggest pet peeves is when people call these stress hormones. Because what they do, even though I've referred to them as that in this talk, I know. But they, they know, for their comprehensive exams, they should not say this. Um, these are energy mobilizing hormones. They mobilize energy so the animal can deal with some sort of challenge. And this could be something very predictable, like producing this cute baby side blotch lizard. This requires energy to occur. Or it could be something unpredictable, like encountering the snake and trying to get away. Both of these things cause these same hormone levels to increase, which makes it very hard to use them by themselves as an indicator for the health of a population. You get a very messy signal, or you can get a very messy signal using just this application alone. So we think, and I, I especially think, that it's important to make functional assessments as well, things that are important to tell you something about the health and the reproductive success of individuals in the wild. And we focus on immune function, critical for individual health and survival, and reproduction, which is critical for population persistence. All right, let's travel down to the Galapagos Islands and talk about what is, in my mind, one of the coolest animals on the face of the planet. Our only solely marine reptile, well, not reptile, but only solely marine lizard. They can filter salt water, and they're just awesome. And we're using them to answer this question, what does a very specific type of human encounter mean for their physiology? Ecotourism. <laughs> so going about this, we have to justify as scientists to our bosses and our funding agencies why places like this are important for us to go. And actually in the Galapagos, this is a very easy justification. There are very few places like this where you can still find pristine populations that nobody is allowed to visit unless you have a permit like me. So the Galapagos is an ideal place because we're seeing right now increases in population growth rate on the local islands and increase in ecotourism at astounding rates. And we really need to understand what this sort of increase in human pressure means for these natural populations. And the Galapagos itself is also the perfect natural experiment to ask this sort of question because we have many different isolated animal populations to work with. And across these populations, some come into contact with hundreds to even up to 1,000 people daily, whereas others never see people at all. And we're talking about populations that are less than a kilometer apart on the same coastline, similar size. So it's really this perfect natural experiment. As I mentioned, ecotourism is increasing at astounding rates. We're up to, as about 2010, 180,000 people a year. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but there's actually very few tourist sites. So these are very concentrated um, exposures that these animals are getting. And we're also seeing an increase in population growth on the islands as this money from ecotourists goes into the uh, Galapagos. It's a very desirable place for local Ecuadorians to live. So this is something that the Galapagos National Park is trying to manage right now and have a better understanding of how it's going to impact this um, archipelago. So why marine iguanas? There's a lot of different models in the Galapagos that we could choose. 
But these animals are perfect to do ecophysiology on. They've been studied for over 20 years by one of my collaborators at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Um, this gives us a great basis of natural history with which to base our studies moving forward. We know a lot about them already. They're not endangered. Now, this is important. It's really interesting and important to understand endangered species, but some of the things we do are minimally invasive. We do collect blood samples. And if there's a species that's already on the brink, we really don't want to make a bad situation worse. So for the sorts of questions we're asking right now, I prefer focusing on not species that are not endangered. These animals are seasonal breeders. So we can find them reliably at certain times of the year in reproductive mode and in non-reproductive mode. And because of their breeding ecology, we can actually collect large numbers of animals at the same time. These animals congregate in large breeding groups called leks, where the males defend territories and the females come in and the males will mate with them. And we can basically sample, you know, in a small area, there's hundreds of animals that we can just walk up to and sample. They're also long-lived. So we can track these individuals at their site because they're territorial throughout their lifetime and understand how the changing environment impacts them as they age. And then finally, the most important thing and one of the biggest benefits for reptiles here is you can actually collect them easily and sample them easily. And so you remember these hormones, cortisol, corticosterone that I'm talking about, they change within three minutes of handling these animals. The animal is stressed when you handle them. And so if we want to understand what they look like naturally at their baseline levels without us stressing them out, we need to be able to get a hold of them and collect that sample quickly. And you can see me. This is one of my favorite sites, Tortuga Bay in the, on um, the island of Santa Cruz. And here's one of the animals I'm trying to collect. So you can walk right up to them and pick them up. And I can usually get a blood sample within a minute of catching this animal. One, something that big I would need Nick to hold for me, but I can't do both at the same time yet, but uh, I could probably do this one by myself at the same time. Okay, so what are we measuring? We're looking at body condition, so the size of these animals, their weight, their mass, and their length. We're also looking at the number of ectoparasites. So this is, again, a student, Eric, who's helping one of my collaborators measure uh, the tail where these animals store a lot of their body fat. We're also looking at the number of eggs, these females' clutch size. So this is, again, my graduate student, Lori, um, using our, our portable ultrasound to ultrasound this female to measure the number and size of her eggs in the field. And this is our high-tech sun shield. It's actually one of our iguana bags, but uh, <laughs> it's pretty sunny on desert islands, and there's very little shade, so we had to get creative here. Um, cutaneous wound healing. These animals, actually all reptiles, are frequently wounded in the wild. Um, of every population I've ever sampled, over 50% of the animals have a wound or a scar from some sort of encounter. So in marine iguanas, this is also true, and it's something very real they have to deal with on a regular basis. Um, this is a female, and you can see this big laceration here. Um, they get these frequently in the breeding season. The males, when they're ready to mate, will pick the females up by their neck and carry them around over the rocks. And imagine trying to deal with this while you're trying to produce eggs at the same time. It's pretty challenging. Um, a lot of digit loss, and usually that's from infighting amongst the marine iguanas. And then a lot of tail lacerations, or actually total tail loss in these animals. Um, this could be from sharks. A lot of them, they swim and dive down deep to get algae, especially the big males. More likely explanation is actually um, sea lions. So there's a really healthy population of sea lions in the Galapagos, and they consider iguanas their own personal playthings. So I don't know if any of you have a dog that likes to play with squeaky toys and throw them up in the air. Yeah, they do that at the expense of the poor iguana, and you will see a lot of, they don't usually want to eat them, but you'll see a lot of lacerations like that um, from sea lion encounters. And then we're also looking at stress reactivity by, again, collecting blood sample. This is a different um, Ecuadorian student, Christian, that worked with us for a couple of years. And we can collect these blood samples and, again, measure their hormone levels. And then we can also use these same blood samples to measure their immune system. We can look at specific immune pathways. We can also challenge that blood with certain types of bacteria to look and see how well that blood can clear a bacterial infection. 
So basically what we're doing right now, our design that we have, is we've got pairs of um, sites on three different islands. Each of these pairs consists of a tourist site that sees up to hundreds of people daily and a corresponding site in close proximity where people are not allowed to go. And we're measuring these, these uh, endpoints that I just talked to you about. Now really the question we're asking is what does this sort of encounter mean for these animals? It really doesn't look overtly harmful, right? But is it enough to alter their physiology and have consequences for these individuals? And the answer is yes. Um, just to show you for all the graphs I'm going to be pointing out, um, these purple bars are the tourist sites and the yellow bars are the corresponding undisturbed sites. And what you can see from this graph, um, as we're looking at these animals' hormone release to a stress, we see that we're getting a greater hormonal release in these tourist sites. Okay, so there's something different about their physiology. But this alone doesn't tell us whether or not there are any consequences, it just says that they're different. But there are consequences. We, we've looked at wound healing ability in these animals, and again, as you look at the tourist sites, you see that they're both different from the undisturbed sites. They have a reduced healing ability relative to these animals in populations that are just down the beach from them. Basically the same habitat, but just don't see people. And just to remind you what this wound healing looks like, um, this is us out in the field measuring it. Um, just to give you an idea, again, with my student, Christian. And here are a couple of other examples of wound healing that we see. Um, complete limb loss, which, you know, imagine healing from that with no antibiotics in, in this sort of environment. It's, uh, it's pretty astounding that they can survive and deal with these things. The other thing we see is it's not just whether or not they're exposed to tourism or not. It's actually the degree of exposure, the intensity. So if we look at a, a group of different tourist sites with increasing numbers of tourists visiting those sites, we see that their ability to kill a foreign bacteria decreases as they're exposed to more people. So intensity matters as well. What about reproduction? So we know immunity is affected. We know their stress physiology is affected. What about reproduction? I just want to really quickly show you what their breeding groups look like. We actually have, this is a, a, a breeding group or a lek on one of our undisturbed populations. And I just want to show you the two territories here. Here's one of our dominant males and here's another. And what you could see if you zoomed in really closely and counted all these iguanas is over 110 iguanas in this really small area. The other thing that is really difficult to see that I can't see or you can't see is there's some invisible line here that divides these two territories and these iguanas know not to pass. If one goes over to the other side, there will be a drop down, drag out fight between these guys that is not pretty and they don't want to do that in the middle of the breeding season. They want to save their energy so they can breed with females. So they don't cross that line usually. Um, so we measured reproduction uh, clutch sizes in females across these different sites and we found consistently reduced clutch sizes at these tour sites relative to the undisturbed sites, suggesting that there could be effects on population size in the long run. Now, there's a little anecdote that I want to tell you about that the locals have told me. So this is not scientific you know, fact. This isn't, I have no data other than personal observations to back this up, but it's a really cool idea. We do see, a, the locals say we see a huge increase in breeding across all of these populations right during an El Nino event, at the beginning of an El Nino event. And my first trip there was a minor El Nino event, and there were baby iguanas all over the streets of Porte Ora, the main town. They had to close off the streets so cars wouldn't drive over them. So, you know, that's, that's interesting. There's also other physiological changes, though, that occur during El Nino that are, that are similar to what we're seeing here. We're seeing increased stress reactivity during an El Nino event, just like we see at our tour sites. And this is something that I want to look at a little bit further, and I'm hoping in the future to be able to get the funds to do this and, and the logistical support to do this. Um, because what goes on in El Nino is a general increase in water temperature. So the marine systems in the Galapagos do not fare well during an El Nino event. And especially the marine iguanas that feed on this algae, red and green algae, um, this type of algae gets outcompeted for by a different type, 
a brown type that is not nutritious and these animals don't like to eat. And so what we see happening is mass starvation and die-offs. In the most severe El Nino event, we saw up to 90% of some of the populations dying. And so we think what might be going on is the stress of tourism is altering these animals' feeding behavior and perhaps putting them in an energy deficient state just like what's happening during an El Nino event. So we're hoping in the future to be able to measure feeding behavior at the tourist sites, which in females and juveniles is really easy. They come out into these algae beds when the tide goes out in the intertidal zone and they feed. We can easily assess this. Males, it's a little bit more challenging. They dive down deep into these subtidal regions and there's strong currents, it's cold water, it's dangerous. I had a bad run in with a lava rock. I do not want to be down in with the currents uh, trying to measure this. But we can take advantage of their ecology and do this um, basically remotely. We can implant temperature data loggers and IDs, and we can look at their daily temperature relative to the ocean and the air temperature. And this is an iguana profile over six days. And these things take body temperature basically every minute for up to a year, depending on how you program them. And so, if we look here, this is the ocean temperature in blue, red is the air temperature, and this black is the iguana temperature. You see that during the day, we get two dips down to this blue ocean temperature. That's when that male is out feeding. So we can measure the length of these feeding bouts, the feeding effort that these males do, to try to assess whether or not there is any effect of tourism at these sites. So at least in this system, we know that there are altered endocrine responses in response to tourism, and we know that we're getting a suppression of immunity, and it seems to be a suppression of reproduction, which is worrisome, but these animals are long-lived. They have multiple opportunities to breed in the future. So hopefully, we're looking at one time point, and maybe the next year it'll be better. What about the population, though? Our ultimate goal is to take these variables and relate them back to population performance. And in a very long-lived animal like a, a marine iguana, this is going to take us many, many years. So we're going to travel back to Utah, a little bit closer to home, to ask this question more quickly. So this is uh, St. George in southern Utah. And we're going to look at a seemingly different animal, but one that's actually very similar to the marine iguana in a few key ways. And this is the side blotch lizard. Like marine iguanas, these animals are highly prolific. They're also territorial, so I can repeatedly sample the same individuals. But they're shorter lived, one to two years. So I can use the measures that we're taking and relate them to the lifetime survival and reproductive success over a much shorter time frame to try to better understand that relationship. They're also found in this urban environment. So I'm looking at a very different type of human disturbance, per se, in this situation than the, than the um, Galapagos. So there's some other interesting side projects that we've got going on. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of those today. We're using a very similar design. We have eight research sites across this urban environment, um, half rural and half urban, and we're measuring the same endpoints that I talked about for the marine iguanas. And so how do these animals look? When we compare this town lizard and this country lizard, are we dealing with the same lizard? Well, when we look at stress response, we're seeing something very similar to what we saw in the marine iguanas. We're getting elevated stress reactivity in the, in the urban environment. We're also getting decreased immunity in the urban environment. Again, just like we saw at these tourist sites in the Galapagos. Reproduction, though, we see something a little different. And this was surprising to us. We actually are getting an increase in breeding um, in both in terms of the number of eggs and also the size of those eggs in the urban environment, which was very surprising to us. And this is just to show you what one of our ultrasounds look like. And this is a former undergraduate of mine, Michael, who's um, ultrasounding a lizard. So what's going on here? Why are we seeing this different response? Well, what we think is happening is we're dealing with a very different species. The regular stress of being exposed frequently to two people in a human environment or elements of the urban environment is causing these animals to use energy differently. It's causing them to invest more heavily in the reproductive system because they don't have future breeding opportunities like the marine iguana. They've got one year, if they're lucky, two years, but usually about one year. 
And this huge increase means they don't have a lot left over for their immune system, which is okay because they're not gonna survive a long time anyways. And so why waste energy there when you only have one breeding opportunity? So does this relate to the population? We would think this sort of large scale change in, in physiological strategy would have population effects. And the answer is yes, it does. These animals in an urban environment have reduced survival relative to the urban populations that we're studying. And this is something that's really interesting. This is actually only one year out of four and a half years of data, and the thing that I'm very excited about moving forward is that we've got a lot of environmental variation in terms of um, what the weather has been like down in St. George, what water availability has been like, and I'm really interested to see how this changes over time with that environmental change. So what can we say from all of this? Well, using this approach, we can, it allows us to be able to determine what populations are most susceptible out in nature, and hopefully also what makes those populations more susceptible. So in the case of these um, side blush lizards down in St. George, maybe we need to worry a little bit about invasive parasites or diseases because they're suppressed immune system, and that could be more problematic for these populations. In the, in the Galapagos, we have to worry about both of those things both reduce breeding. Um, potentially, maybe if their feeding behavior is being altered, if that's in the future what we figure out is the problem, we can reduce tourism at the times when they're trying to reproduce and limit it to those sites so those animals can feed better and better reproduce. Understanding these sorts of responses, though, are critical is this is what our natural world is continuing to look like. Um, human population growth is leaving few populations untouched, whether it be ecotourism, urbanization, industry, or agriculture, this is the new natural. Things are not going to change, and we can't go back and restore these populations or these sites to what they used to look like, so we have to find a way to move forward from where we are now, from this new natural state. And I really hope that I've shown you today that these sorts of changes can affect the stress physiology of the animals that live in these environments and the way that they use their energy, both at the individual and at the population level. So I just briefly, especially since they showed up today, have to thank a lot of people. Um, my graduate students and undergraduate students, they are responsible for the majority of this work. They are phenomenal. And um, yeah, I mean, this is their work as well. A, a lot of collaborators and then also funding sources, the Utah Agricultural Experiment Station, the USU VPR's office, and then also the National Science Foundation have been so supportive um, for everything that I do. And I also have to uh, thank my husband and my two-year-old who are not only my greatest support, but also a welcome distraction a lot of the time. <laughs> and a lot, of, um, a lot of different organizations that help me with logistical support to make this research possible. It really wouldn't be possible without them. And this is what we look like at our field sites and in the lab. So with that, I will take any questions you might have. Questions? Yeah. Uh, would any of the ubiquitous uh, immunoreactive pollutants like the PCBs or the dioxins affect your baseline mm -hmm. response? Definitely, definitely, and it's a very complex, complex story. Um, as I mentioned before, these hormones are changing for various things, just in normal function, not just stress. So trying to interpret that data is really challenging, which is why we've been moving more into looking at the immune system and these other, other measures. But yes, I actually, one of my graduate students is really interested, Lori, who I kept showing you pictures of, is interested in ecotoxicology, and she's been looking at um, pesticides for dry, dry land farming, and then also a couple of other, um, these PBDEs that are pretty much ubiquitous in the environment. They've been found in human breast milk, human tissues. So we can try to have a better understanding of what these mean for you know, other populations. She's working with garter snakes because they're higher up predator in this environment, and so they feed on animals that feed on insects that could be infected. And so we're seeing whether or not there's any sort of trophic transfer occurring there. But that's, that's a great question. So yes, how variably, depending on what, what specific contaminant you're talking about. Yeah. So 
So, so if I understood you correctly, in the urban environment of St. George, the reproductive activity of the animals increases, right? Right, larger overall clutch and sizes. Anecdotally, when you see El Nino in the Galapagos, the reproductive activity increases. Yes. Right? So what I think, no, that's a great question. What I think is going on there is that those animals, they think they're not going to make it. So normally, they're like, oh, I got more years, I got more years, but they get into the starvation event and they think they're not going to make it, so they just put everything in and go for broke, basically. It's kind of happening, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, so do you see, is there anything that indicates that there's an increase in El Nino activity now in the Galapagos? So the most severe event that we've seen so far was still back in the 80s, but there have been more frequent events. They've been smaller, but more frequent. And I'm not a weather scientist, yeah, but the last one that I saw was in early 2008, and it was a very minor event, but it was, again, this is something I want to look at more, um, but yeah, it's going to take a lot longer time to keep going back and looking at these patterns, yeah. Or, as long as you don't tell everybody, so they don't catch all my lizards. Um, we go out, we're actually, well, these people are experts at it, but uh, you go out with a retractable fishing pole or a stick, and you make a noose. And now my favorite substrate of choice is dental floss, minty. Um, I think it works better. They actually prefer fishing line, some of them. I don't know, but yeah, for me, it's dental floss. And you just make a little slip knot noose, and you pick up the animal. And they're very light, so it doesn't, they're not scared of that. They're scared of you. They will try to eat it though sometimes. So that's that's challenging. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're studying reptiles, but if you look at, for example, deer herds along the Wasatch Front, animals right. that adapt to humans, mm -hmm. perhaps because there's less mm -hmm. predation. Right. Is there any uh, study that compares adaptive to adaptive mm -hmm. to different types of animals versus humans and other species? You know, that's a really good question because depending on what groups of animals you see, you see different responses. So one thing I didn't have time to talk about is even in the marine iguanas, there is what is called behavioral habituation. So the animals at tourist sites are much easier for me to catch. So they're behaving differently. They're not as scared of me as at these naive populations at undisturbed sites. Um, generally what they think happens in populations like deer is the adaptive uh, idea would be that you would decrease that stress response over time because if you maintain it too high for too long it's going to be bad. You're going to have immunosuppression, reproductive suppression and there are studies that are looking at this. The problem is to measure hormones like that in a deer population you would have to catch them and you wouldn't get the baseline sample in time. There is a lot of use of fecal steroids. I actually measure or our lab measures fecal steroids from coyotes, from collaborators and um, I've done elephants before, that was, that was fun. You just need a subsample, you don't need the whole, <laughs> whole thing to work with. But, uh, but yeah, so that people are using that, and the problem with that is, it's not a problem. You need to know what your question is, but you're measuring a composite of basically however long that fecal material took to make is how much hormone is deposited, and you don't know what happened during it. So it, it's, it is, and people are trying to, but depending on the model, it's challenging to do, and that's why these guys are a lot easier to catch than a, than a deer. But yes, this is, this is, and coyotes, especially we're seeing a lot more coyotes in urban environments, which people are concerned about for children's safety, and, and so that's been a major issue of study recently, too. Yeah. You know, that's, that could be very true. It's very true. We've actually looked at several different back types of bacteria and seen a consistent um, result. The other thing we see is higher parasitic infections, usually in these tourist sites as well. What leads me to believe that it is an actual suppression of the immune system is that the multiple measures we're using together, we're seeing a similar response. If it was just that, I agree. It could be that immune, immunological tolerance, it's like, well, it's not going to kill us, so let's just let it be at low levels, and it's fine. Let's not waste that energy building an immune response against it. 
Um, the, the way that we challenge this, though, is basically dealing with whatever is innately available in the blood sample we take. So it's, it's not an in vivo challenge per se, but yeah. But it, I mean, I cannot say that it is not immunological tolerance. But along the lines of evidence with the other assays that we're doing, we're seeing consistent, consistently lower responses across different parts of the immune system. You, you mentioned that sharks are one of the natural predators. Are there any land predators that they have to worry about that also raise their stress level? Yes. Um, when they're younger, when they're younger and also the females, they have to worry about birds. So there's Galapagos harks, or har uh, hawks. Galapagos hawks especially will prey on the little ones. So they do have to worry about birds, but once they get above a certain size, no. Um, there are introduced predators, though, and they, there was a study done by um, a colleague of mine that showed that they actually, that increased their flightiness or stress fleeing behavior when they were exposed to dogs and cats more frequently. So that's the biggest issue we're running into, cats being brought in by the local population and dogs eating these iguanas. Um, so there are new predators that were not there before, but yeah, um, some of the populations we study don't have that, and some do, and it would be really interesting to look at those responses to different types of challenges, especially as some have more recently been exposed to these introduced species to see whether or not we get a habituation or a change over time as they start to learn what those predators look like. That would be really cool. <coughs> I'd be curious, I was curious on this question of deer. I'd be curious of the correlation with human beings of what happened, you look at St. George when there were 20 people there and now a couple hundred. I'd be real curious yeah. the correlation of longevity, we live longer right. and that. It'd right. be interesting to see some of that. I completely agree, I completely agree. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, we maintain the same stress response as these animals and it's actually the same pathway from our hypothalamus pituitary to adrenal glands, exactly as these animals. So what I would guess is like these animals, there's gonna be a lot of variation in how people perceive and respond. But yeah, I mean, ideally you would habituate over time, but if not, I mean, if you maintain these chronically high stress levels, you're gonna have, well, you're gonna get sick like I do on vacation, you know? So yeah, no, I, I agree, I, I would love to see more work like that. Suzanne, you've been known to have an army of students. That's what's been described to me. And you've got five here. Would you introduce your yes, students? Yes, have stand would, up, please. please uh, yes, I would be happy to. This is Nick Kiriazis. He was a graduate student, um, master's student, and is now a local high school teacher at Og Ogden Venture Academy. This is Marlies Vanderwalt. She is an undergraduate, one of the USU research fellows that are recruited out of high school to come do work. And so I've, I've been lucky enough to have her. And then also Austin Spence, who is also a research fellow. I've had both of them since they were freshmen. And they, they are, I mean, no offense, you guys, but they're every bit as good as my graduate students. <laughs> and they are going to have their own first author papers coming out here this summer, right? OK, yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll get those papers out this summer. No, but they've been invaluable. Um, and then this is Jeffrey Smith. One of my PhD students, he just passed his Kennedy exam this week. Um, so he will be getting his PhD in a couple of years here. But, um, and then I have three other graduate students. Um, two of them are out in the field right now collecting snakes in Oregon. So they could not be here. And another one is hosting a speaker at USU uh, today. So we're busy. We keep busy. But yes, they are invaluable to everything that I do. Ladies and gentlemen, Susanna French. <laughs> Well, we've had another uh, incredibly wonderful uh, launch of uh, Sunrise with you. Uh, this has been fun. Please hold the date for August 1st. We'll be back with you again to launch our, our uh, fall series. If any of you have parked here at, at the hotel, just let them know if you're in Self Park that you're with Utah State, and that will be all covered for you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great fun. We wish you a day of little stress. <laughs> Thank you.